spoke, and I'm the ivy. Say, how close do you want to be to Jesus? I want to be that close. Amen? Praise the Lord for that. Take your Bible tonight. Go with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4 tonight. Hebrews chapter 4. Continue our study through the book of Hebrews. And the more I study Hebrews, the more I see in Hebrews. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. We're going to look at verse 3 tonight. Then our text is verse 4. We're also going to go to Hebrews chapter, um, no, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 1 uh, in a little bit. So I'll give you a heads up there, but that's kind of easy. That's usually pretty easy. Genesis chapter 1 is pretty easy to find. We're in Hebrews chapter 4. Now we looked at, in this passage in Hebrews chapter 4, we looked at the, the promises of God. Uh, we looked at the importance of faith. Now I want to uh, point your attention to verse 3 and verse 4, and it makes this interesting reference here. It says this, for we which have believed, if you've believed, say amen. Amen, I have believed. Do you enter into rest? How many of you guys are glad you can rest in Jesus? I'm so glad. Listen, I'm glad that I'm not trying to work my way to heaven. I'm glad I'm not trying to hold out. Here, here's an interesting truth about sheep. Do you know this? Sheep don't have fingers. You know, the sheep can't hold on to anything. If the shepherd doesn't hold on to the sheep, the sheep can't hold on to them. We've entered into his rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, that they shall enter into my rest. Now notice here, this is the phrase we want to focus in tonight. Although the works were finished, look at this, from the what? From the foundation of the world. Verse 4, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day. From all his works. And, uh, and so we'll pause there. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for this night. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, to get into our Bibles and to study our Bibles. And so, Lord, we thank you for every word in the Bible. We thank you, Lord, it is spiritual sustenance. God, there's rich truths for us to find. And so, Lord, help us tonight to go home, Lord, with, with our heart full of wonderful truth. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. And amen. Now, there's two things that are very important in verses 3 and verse 4. First thing in verse 3, and we're going to get into this next week. There's two parts to this lesson. Part 1, that we're going to look at the actual, uh, it says that here that it says, uh, his works were finished from the foundation of the world. That's what we're going to focus on. Well, what was the foundation of the world? When was the foundation of the world? How do we know what the foundation of the world is? is all right and, and number two and we're, this is going to be part two next week we're going to look at well what was finished what was finished was the work of christ the work of your salvation the work of my salvation when was when was that done it was done in jesus and listen the plan the plan and the program and the process listen before god before genesis 1 1 can i say this your salvation listen the plan and the purposing of the God, it was settled. It was, that's why we don't wrestle with our salvation. That, that's why we don't believe that you have to hold out to the end. Listen, God has saved you to the uttermost. And so, but tonight, I want to focus on this first part. Well, what is the foundation of the world? There's only, listen, there's only two views of the foundation of the world. There, there's the biblical view, the God view, the right view, listen, and then there's everybody else, all right? Even though there might be a smattering, there might be a broad spectrum of those who are like, ah, I don't really believe the Bible, I, don't, I believe in this or I believe in that. Listen, friend, either it's God's way or it's man's way. Tonight we're going to look at God's way. What does God teach us? What does God tell us about the foundation of the world? And, and then we're going to answer this question, why is that important? Why does it matter what we believe about where everything came from? All right, none of us are old enough to be there. Jerry's getting close, but he wasn't there. All right, long before Brother Jerry even came along, listen, before the foundation of the world. All right, let's make it sure Brother Jerry's paying attention back there. All right, he is, he's doing good. He's looking for the first fill in the blank. Now, listen, long before the foundation of the world, listen, none of us were there. So if none of us were there, how do we know what was there? Well, we have God's word. And my friend, notice with me in verse 4, for he spake, God spake in a certain place, talking about the book of Genesis, of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. 
See, God is making a point in Hebrews chapter 4 to say, listen, Christian, you can rest. You can rest in God's sovereignty because when God finished creation on the, seventh, on the sixth day and God blessed the seventh day, listen, God was making a point. It's done. It's finished. Now, let's look into our notes tonight. Just kind of give you an introduction of where we are, what we are, what we're looking at, what's it all about. Let's look at our notes today. The uh, creation is a foundational fact. Creation is a foundational fact. Notice with me, tonight and throughout your lesson, I put lots of scriptures. There's so many scriptures through the Bible, there's no way I could even get them all uh, on your lesson tonight. Look at Revelation chapter 4, it, it, exclaiming in the halls of heaven, he, the, the Bible says this, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created, how many things? All things. Now why were they created? For thy pleasure they are and were created. Friend, let me just take a, let, let me answer one of the greatest questions that people ask. I see, these young, I see this young man here, and I, I see some young men over here. Listen, can I just say this, and some young ladies down here, and many times young people are questioning, why am I here? What's the purpose of life? What's the meaning of my existence on this little blue ball that's spinning through outer space at bit, bit, thousands of miles an hour in this huge universe, galaxy, in this massive universe? What's the point? Why? Why am I here? I'll show you right here. In, in, in Revelation chapter 4, and verse 11, it says, For thy pleasure they are and were created. God created you. God gave you your life. God gave you your life, listen, so that you could have a relationship with him. And through that relationship with him, listen, God could have an enjoyable relationship with you. Can you imagine that? That's the purpose of life, that I may know him, he may know me. And in having that relationship, listen, God, God is not only glorified, God is pleased. He's well pleased. God desires to have a relationship with you, to know you, to walk with you. And listen, and in that relationship, listen, in knowing him and walking with him, our Heavenly Father, listen, you know what? It puts a smile on his face. It puts joy in his heart. That's what I want. Now, go with, uh, go with me in your notes here. Let's get on track here. There is a reason. Now, I also, I, I had all kinds of things highlighted and underlined for you to fill in, and I realized we would never get through that. <laughs> so I'm going to have you highlight or, or circle a few things tonight there is a reason for two things the number one uh, underline the word popularity and number two underline the word promotion there is a reason for the popularity and promotion of the underline this false underline this unproven and underline this devil inspired circle the word theory of evolution there is a reason for the popularity and promotion of the false unproven devil inspired theory of evolution you know why? Because creation, biblical creation, establishes God as the supreme, sovereign creator of the universe. And there are implications of that. And listen to me, the atheist and the evolutionist, they understand that probably better than we do. They fight tooth and nail. Listen, you want to make some people a little, a little nervous? You start talking about the biblical fact of creation. You start knocking underneath the, 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 the false science, the pseudoscience that they rest on. Listen, friend, they get, listen, the veins pop out. Listen, their eyeballs get buggy. Listen, the red, listen, because you are undermining their faith. Because they understand there's an implication if God is the supreme sovereign creator of the universe, what are those implications? Number one, as creator, he alone has the sole right of ownership. If God is, and he is, the sovereign creator, that means God owns everything in the universe. It's his. Then if he owns it, listen, it's not mine, it's not yours. We're simply stewards and caretakers. Number two, and to him, all creation is accountable all creation is accountable to God if he created us and he did that means every man every woman every boy every girl listen they are accountable they are responsible they are answerable to God and can I say do you know why in Psalm chapter 2 it says this why do the heathen rage 
Why do the people imagine a vain thing? Listen, friend, that's the, that is the job and the goal and the description of the atheists, the evolutionists. They are mad because, listen, they want to do what they want to do, how they want to do it, when they want to do it, and they want no consequences from it. And listen, friend, it's not baked in that way. Listen, it's not baked in that way. God, listen, God gives us a freedom of choice. God gives us the opportunity to choose to listen, to not listen, to obey or not listen. To obey. But listen, God gives us the freedom of choice, but God reserves the right of consequence. And that really troubles those that do not want to submit to God. The fact, back in your notes, the fact of biblical creation is the very underpinning of the truth about sin. And what is sin? The breaking of God's laws or commands. And the need for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, understanding creation, understanding the biblical account of creation is necessary to have a biblically correct worldview. Next two words is worldview. And eternal perspective. See, here's the thing. You and I, as Bible believers, we live on earth. Everybody say amen to that. Amen? Right. Now, the, the atheist, the evolutionist, guess what? They also live on earth, right? Same, we're all living on the same earth, right? Now, okay, we'll use an example. We have, we, since we understand, we believe God, we understand, listen, we have a world, we, have the, we look at the world through the lenses, the worldview of biblical creation. So when we look at something like the Grand Canyon, how many Grand Canyons are there? There are one Grand Canyon. There's not two Grand Canyons, there's one Grand Canyon. We look at the Grand Canyon through the lens of the worldview and we say, wow, look at what God did with an amazing amount of water in the flood over a short period of time, right? Because we look at the world, we look at the rocks and the fossils, the evidence, we look at the same ground, the same earth, the same evidence, but we look at it through the lens of the Bible, all right? Now, the evolutionist doesn't have that worldview. They have a different set of glasses that they put on. They put on billions and billions of years, random chance and possibility. And they look at the Grand Canyon. Now, they're looking at the same Grand Canyon. They look at it the same water, the same rocks, the same everything, and they go, look at what a little bit of water did over billions and billions of years. Right? You see, it's kind of like, I explained this one time. I said, you take Lake Michigan. The people, uh, the, the, the fine folks in Michigan say, isn't the sunset beautiful over Lake Michigan. How many of you have ever seen the sunset over Lake Michigan? It's beautiful. Now you get the folks over in Chicago and Milwaukee and they say, no, 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 no. The sun doesn't set over Lake Michigan. The sun rises over Lake Michigan. In Chicago, when they watch the sun rise, it comes up over, they're like, the sun doesn't set over Lake Michigan. Well, yes, it does. It does from our side of the lake, right? Same body of water, two different perspectives. Now, you can sit there and fight and argue all the want. Listen, it's the same sun, it's the same earth, it's the same water. Listen, but you're looking at it from two totally different perspectives. Understand, listen, the evolutionists, the creationists, listen, we're not looking at two sets of rocks, two sets of fossils, two sets of worlds. Listen, we're just looking at things completely differently. And that's why we don't agree and that's why we don't see things. Listen, we don't understand. Listen, please understand. They'll never see what we see until they put on the right World, how many of you have to wear glasses? You guys have to wear glasses. I have to, I, I, for many years, I was born and I, uh, I didn't realize, I just thought the whole world was fuzzy. I just went, I, I just didn't, I didn't know everybody could see it. I was, went to school, I think the teacher said, hey, Mrs. Pofel, I think you need to have your son checked out. He can't read the blackboard. I went in, I got a pair of glasses. I was like, whoa, high definition, color, everything's crisp and clear. This is amazing. All right. It changed my life. And then, of course, I was a boy. And then, then every once in a while, I'd take my glasses off. And like, like the world would go gray and fuzzy. And then I'd have to clean my glasses. And I'd be like, wow, it's amazing. Listen, notice with me. Look with me in, in your notes here in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. In Romans 1, 20, the Bible says this. For the invisible things of him, about God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. If the evolutionist admits that there is a God who created the universe. What does that mean? Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. When someone truly admits, listen, there's no way that this world and all its complexity spun out of a big bang, listen, from chaos to order. Listen, friend, when they honestly step back and say, well, there has, if there's design, there has to be a designer. If there's make, there has to be a maker. 
Can I just, it, it's kind of like this. I, I use this example here. Um, it, okay, you got this phone here, okay? Uh, d- you know, highly organized piece of technical hardware. A- and imagine if I just took, and so you see this phone, and you know what a phone does, a smartphone, and all this thing, and all this connectivity, and all the pieces, parts, and all the things that go together. Now imagine if I just took the base elements, okay, a little silica, all right, uh, uh, so, some, some titanium, some gold, so, some just, just the raw elements, some, some steel, some aluminum, some tin, some gold, uh, some silica. And, and I would take all of those elements and, and then pop them in a bag and, and shake it, all right, for a, a, for, for a billion years. Is, is it ever, th- those, those, th- that silica, that sand, those, those elements, uh, those, this, this, those raw materials. And if I were to take that bag, oh, I can't, I lost my bag. And um, uh, if I were to take that bag and I were to shake that bag, shake it, shake it, shake it. And I'd shake it for a million years. Friend, listen to me. What the evolutionist says is, wow, out of that bag came a perfectly formed, completely set, updated, highly technological, internet-connected device. Now, can I just tell you that, friend? Listen, you know what that requires? That requires requires a whole lot more faith than I have. All right? To say that all of the mechanisms form themselves. That all of the individual elements and pieces, they stratified and solidified in in exactly the right order at the exact right time. And they were exactly meshed together to make it what it was. Now listen, when you see this, this didn't just happen. This doesn't sprout from a tree. It doesn't come out of a stream. Listen, it it has a design. You know what it tells you? It has a designer. It has an order. That means somebody with some orderliness made it. That's what it screams. Now, who believes in creation? I believe in creation, but listen, let's not take your word or my word for it. Go with me to Mark chapter 10. Go with me to Mark chapter 10 tonight, and I want to see, I want to show you an eyewitness account that gave testimony of the fact of creation, all right? So here it is, slam dunk, case close, Mark chapter 10 and verse 6. In Mark chapter 10, notice with me in verse 6 and 7, it says, but this is Jesus speaking here, but from the beginning of what? The creation. Who? God made them male and female. Listen, you know who's talking here? Jesus. Jesus is giving a testimony of the fact of creation. You know what? Excuse me. Jesus believed in creation. All right? Just let's sink that in. Jesus testified of the truth, the veracity of creation. Notice in your notes here, Jesus himself testified to the fact of biblical creation. Why? He was there. He is an eyewitness that the heavens and the earth and every living creature came into being by his willful creative act. Let me give you the implications of uh, denying creation. Listen, as a Christian... To deny creation is to accuse Jesus of either lying or being ignorant. That should make you (gasps) suck air a little bit, all right, when you think of the implications on that. That is why we do not try to synchronize evolution or pseudoscience with the Bible, because it is to say that Jesus was a liar or ignorant. Now, biblical creation, when you understand that God created the heavens and the earth in six literal days, What does that answer for you? Well, it answers the five biggest questions of life. By the way, uh, a typo in your notes here. It says here, biblical creation explains four, cross it out and say five, of life's most pressing questions. What are those? Number one, where we came from. Where did we come from? Well, we came from God. Why are we here? Because God created us to be here. Why is there suffering and death? Because after God created a perfect world, the devil created or the devil introduced sin and confusion it all makes sense when you follow the biblical narrative how do we know right from wrong well if there is a god who created all things and that god has decreed that there is right then it's right and if what he says is wrong is wrong and then lastly number five is there life after death these are questions that the evolutionist and the atheist cannot answer They are, let me give you the again, where did we come from? Why are we here? Why is there suffering and death? How do we know right from wrong? And is there life after death? When we understand that there is a God and he created all things, 
and he is true and he is right, it answers the five greatest questions of life. Now, God gives us all these, uh, God answers all these questions in the Bible. Now, go with me to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Of course, we can't talk about creation without going to the actual account of creation. The Bible says in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Look at verse, day 1 and verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Notice with me, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Very important. If you follow the, the rest of Genesis chapter 1, you'll find that order. You'll find that God creates, and then he summarizes and says the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, we in America, most Western, most of Europe, we follow a solar calendar. We follow the sun. The sun comes up, we say it's the start of a new day. Sun goes down, we say the day's getting done. That's not how God established uh, it. God, God, God uh, introduced the lunar calendar. The Jewish people, their day starts at sundown, exactly opposite of what we do, all right? Uh, at, 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 on, uh, the Sabbath starts every Friday at sundown. It's usually about 6 o'clock, uh, but when the sun goes down for a Jewish person, that starts a new day. That's the start of their due day. It's not at midnight when we start our days, all right? And so understand, God does a little different timekeeping than we, than we do in our society. Now, I want to point this out here. We find in Genesis chapters 1 and 2... Now, I want you to underline these words, the biblical account. Please, I'm going to ask you to do this. This is something, a discipline. Stop referring it to it as a story. It's not a story. It's a historical account. And it happens to be recorded in the Bible. It's a biblical account, meaning it's inspired and preserved. The account of creation is not a story. It is an actual factual event that had, took place. Now, very important note. There are not two creation accounts. If you go out to Google, you go out to Bing and say, uh, uh, information on creation, click. It's going to come up, and one of the things they're going to say is, well, it appears that in the Bible there are two creation accounts. Eh, wrong, unbiblical, misunderstanding. All right, now, Genesis chapter 1, back in your notes, gives us an overview of the seven days of creation. And by the way, while we're on that subject, these are literal, these are seven literal 24-hour days, not eons of time. That is established very clearly in Genesis chapter 1 because in day 1 it says the evening and the morning were the first day. And then the day number 2, it was the evening and the morning of the second day. And the day number 3, and so on, is all through the six days of creation. God makes a point to say, listen, and the evening and the morning, talking about a 24-hour cycle, talking about an actual literal day. Now, Genesis chapter 2 zooms in on the sixth day to give us the details of the creation of Adam and Eve. What we find in Genesis chapter 1 is an overview of all six days. You go to Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, God pauses and says, now listen, the creation of humanity was something different, something special. And so he backs up, he zooms in and gives us a detailed explanation of what actually happened, the order of events, the location of those events that happened. There are not two biblical accounts of creation. There is one account that harmoniously comes together when we understand that Genesis chapter 2 gives us the details of, Genesis, uh, of the sixth day. Now, these, uh, that these days, that these seven days, that these were seven days is corroborated by the hallowing, means making it special, of the seventh day by God as a Sabbath. Next thing you want to write down as by uh, the seventh day. Notice with me in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1. The, and remember, in the original giving of the Bible, there were not chapter breaks. So these all flowed right together. All right? So in, cha in verse 31, it says in God's, of, of chapter 1, And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. In the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them... And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. Where did we read that? We read that in Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says, And God finished the works that he did on the seventh day. Notice here, it says in verse 2, And on the seventh day, God ended his works, which he made. 
And he rested on the seventh day from all his works which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day. That's Saturday, by the way. Sanctified it. Because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. You know what the point is? God says, it's done. It's finished. It's all done. I'm done. It's, pure, it's perfect. God said there was nothing more to add. By the way, you know what Jesus said on the cross? What was those three words? It is finished. We're going to learn about that next week. Now, the, back in your notes, the Jewish weekly Sabbath celebration was a constant reminder of God's act of creation. Every a Sabbath day, as the Jewish folks would pause, you know what it grounded them in? You know what it reminded them of? This is the day God rested. This is the day that God finished the works of creation. It was a constant reminder of this, of this fact. It constantly grounded them back to who they were, where they came from, and who their God was. Now, the Bible, as Bible-believing Christians, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, say amen. Amen. We, the next word is reject. We reject all attempts to harmonize the divine revelation of Scripture, what's in the Bible, with the theory of evolution or the baseless or baseless pseudoscience. Why is that, Pastor? Look at Hebrew, in your notes here, I put Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3. It says this, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. You think of, that, you think of someone when they frame a house. They frame a house. The world, God was out there with his hammer, all right, it, uh, philosophically, all right, metaphorically. He framed up the universe, listen, framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, there has been great damage done to the testimony of Christ. And, and listen, to the, to the, to the uh, um, gen, um, what do I want to say? Great damage has been done to the faith and the testimony of Christ when, when here's what happened Charles Darwin said you know what <clears throat> if, if there is no God how did we get here and that's how he came up with that origin of species we all know about him being on the beagle and going to the Galapagos Islands and all those different things and, and him looking and observing it. He, what he was observing was variation not evolution all right there's so many there, listen there's so many things we don't have time to get. we can make a whole series of this but what happened was there was a hunger this was right towards the end of the 18th century. It was at the beginning of the modern industrial revolution. It was the beginning of the time of the great advancement of science. And what happened was there was a hunger. How did we, how did we get here if there was no God? There was a great falling away of the faith. It's one of the reasons so many people thought there was, that Jesus was coming back at the end of the 1800s before the 1900s. The world was, uh, was progressing technologically at, at vast ways. Now listen, listen, and there was a hunger Listen, there was a hunger to say, listen, there's no God. There's no accountability. Hey, can I, uh, uh, and, okay, I got to stay on track. Stay on track. All right. And so this, listen, this theory, that's all it is, it's a theory, snatched up, latched onto by scientists, education, uh, uh, scientists, educationists, politicians, listen. And it became the prominent, accepted, it, it became the respectable, intellectual, scientific explanation. And so what happened is Christians began to feel a little bad. They're like, oh, you know, we don't want to look ignorant. We don't want to look stupid. We don't want to seem uneducated. And so what happened was there was this, they, they, they tried to take evolution and, and jam it into the Bible. That's where you get the day-age theory. That's where you get the gap theory. You get all kinds of distortions where they're trying to take the, 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 the square peg of evolution and, and put it in the round hole of biblical creation. Listen, friend, it doesn't work. Either God is real and God is true or, listen, it's all wrong. There's no, there's no middle ground. And so as Bible-believing Christians, listen, we reject every attempt, listen, to take away from the truth and the veracity and the historical truth of biblical creation it is an insult to god now listen we believe the bible account just the way that god said what he meant and god meant what he said now let's go to the next section here all right the consistent testimony of scriptures so we've looked at jesus what jesus had to say we've looked at genesis chapter one the actual account of creation now look at uh, i wrote down there in your I put in your notes in psalm 19 one the heavens declare the glory of god and the firmament showeth showeth his handiwork 
Well, let's look at the whole Bible. What does the whole Bible have to say? Think about this. 4,000 years. The Bible was written over a period of 4,000 years. 40 different authors, different backgrounds, different people. Inspired by the same God. Now, from Genesis to Revelation, the writers of the Bible unanimously witness. The word you want to write down there is witness. Unanimously witness to the truth of God as creator. Specifically, 26 books of the Bible, 26 books of the Bible, specifically mention the act of creation in 208 verses. There are 200 very specific verses across 26 books of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, that give testimony of creation. Who were some of these men? Moses, David, Isaiah, Malachi, Mark, Paul, John. These are just some of the biblical writers used of God, listen, to testify of creation. Listen, you're not going to find anything in the Bible that would deviate, that would separate from the consistent testimony. From Genesis to Revelation, you're going to find, listen, that God over and over, listen, he's reassuring, he is reestablishing the truth. Listen, Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter. God establishes the truth of creation. Now, what's the, what's the big deal? Why? Why is there such pushback on creation? Well, look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Look at it in your notes here. I knew that we were going to be, a, uh, take. there was a lot of material, so that's one of the reasons I put a lot of scriptures in. In Romans chapter 5, it says this, Wherefore, as by one man, you see that one man? That one man is Adam. As by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You see, beside the fact that creation establishes God as the owner and Lord of the universe, the biblical account of creation and the subsequent fall of Adam, it establishes, listen, the need of the Savior. It establishes this. Let's look in here. Beyond the implications of God as creator and Lord of the universe, the doctrine of sin and here's a, a technical term, the federal headship of Adam. The federal headship of Adam. What does that mean? It means that God created one man and one woman, and from that one pair, God populated the entire world. It means that there was one original pair, one original person, all right, one original couple, and from them, all of the world descended. Now, that's a whole day. They say, Pastor, where did all the races come from? Where did all the divisions come from? That's a great question. That's because God created in Adam and in Eve all of the genetic potential for all of the races in the world. It's not a question. It's, it's not hard. It's not difficult. It's right there. Now listen, evolution can explain death. Evolution cannot justify right and wrong. You see, you might not know this. Do you know that the Nazis were the number one proponents of evolution in the 30s and 40s? The Nazis justified their horrible, wicked, desperate acts by the theory of evolution. They said, we are the superior race. And as the superior race, we have the right and the, 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 the opportunity to advance ourselves no matter the cost. It's the, it, 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 is the, it is the survival of the fittest. It's the natural, logical progression of the evilness of evolution. Now listen, the, problem, the, the point is this. The reason why evolution, the atheists, hate and fight creation because it establishes their guiltiness of sin. Let's read on here. Adam willfully sinned against God, and the punishment was death for him and all his offspring. Everybody that ever born, was ever born, will, either has died or will die. You know why that is? Because we're all born into the race of Adam. Now, that includes us. Jesus, the second Adam, the second Adam. The Bible refers to him that as in Corinthians 15. Brought the overcoming victory from the failure of our first father. See, what it really gets down to is sin. They don't want to think, the evolutionists refuse to admit that there is sin. Sin being the breaking of God's commandments. And the breaking of God's commandments brings God's judgment. They want to do away with God. And they want to do away with his judgment. How do you do that? You get away, away from creation. If there was no creation, then there's no Adam. If there's no Adam, there's no fall. If there is no fall, then there is no sin. That means we're all just random chances. And I can do whatever I want to do. That's the logical progression of that. Now, lastly, lastly and very briefly. 
the false faith of evolution. The false faith of evolution. The Bible says this, by the way, write this down, Psalm 14.1. That's the reference that got truncated off when I brought the notes over. Psalm 14.1, a psalm of David. The Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. By the way, the, word, the Bible word for fool has the connotation of a moral rebel. Uh, not an intellectual rebel, but a moral rebel. He refuses to be accountable to God's morality. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Notice what happens when you refuse God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Where does the false faith of evolution lead to? It leads to abortion. It leads to infanticide. It leads now, listen, now they're, 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 they're dandling this theory that, listen, a child is not a child. It's not a person until they can walk and talk and volitionally express themselves. Two, three, four years old. Listen, they are pu pushing and promoting that, listen, if a mom or a dad, listen, if they can't handle it, doesn't too much. Listen, they don't like this kid. Listen, they literally can justify the death of that child because that's not a real person because they cannot express it. That's where this wicked, godless, devil-inspired theory leads to. Evolution is an unscientific belief system. I touched on this last week. We don't have time to go over this. It is an unscientific belief system that fruitlessly tries to explain the existence of the universe and of life itself apart from God. It does not follow the scientific method. Spent time talking about that last week. It goes contrary to the laws of observable nature and the laws of matter and energy. Listen, evolution is the most unscientific theory being propagated out there. Listen, it is not science. It is a faith system. They believe in it without proof. Listen, and is constantly being revised and change with every new generation of scientific discovery and advances. Do you know why? Do you know why they constantly have to get rid of the old science textbooks? Do you know why they constantly have to update those things? Because science is constantly proving themselves wrong. I never forget, not that, many, uh, not, not, not that long ago, I was watching a, 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 some kind of science program. All right, I'm a technological mind. I enjoy science and history and archaeology and all those different things. I'll never forget this astrophysicist sitting there. Sitting there, they were interviewing this astrophysicist, and they had, just, they had uh, made some new discovery based on some new thing. And he's like, he said this, a national public television. He said, every textbook in America is wrong. We had it wrong. Yeah. He's just being honest. He said, no, no, we, we, we thought it was this. It was wrong. We changed it. You know what? They've been doing that for over 150 years. And yet, despite repeated failure after failure after failure and continually disproving it wrong and wrong and wrong, listen, they still hold on to it. You know why? It's not science, it's faith. They have faith in that system. This is not science that is faith in a false and flawed theory. Listen, friend, the works of God were finished from the foundation of the world. The found, this world was founded and made by God himself. God created in six literal days. And listen, that's why it's still here together. That's why it's still here today. You know why it's still here today? Because God wills it so. Next week, we're going to come back. We're going to look at the second thing that was finished from the foundation of the world. The work of your salvation that was accomplished by Christ on the cross. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. Uh, thank you, Lord. We're not afraid of science, true science. We're not afraid of history. We're not afraid of fossils. We're not afraid of dinosaurs. We're not afraid of the truth. God, we have the truth. God, you are the, the truth. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. God, we, don't, we thank you, Lord. We don't have to hang our head. We don't have to be ashamed. God, the Christian is not backward. They are not uneducated. They are not simple. They are not ignorant. And God, in fact, the facts are on our side, not their side. There's more evidence and proof for creation than there is for evolution. And Father, I pray, Lord, my heart grieves. Generations of men and women have been raised. Lord, they've been spoon-fed this lie from the time they were a child all the way through college. And God, many of them have never heard, heard a clear presentation of the Bible. Uh, many of them have never heard the gospel. Many of them have never had the opportunity to understand they have been told a lie from the pit of hell. Father, I pray, dear Lord, please, 
Would you help us as Christians to shine the light? Father, we thank you for the fact that we can rest. Lord, we're not a mistake. We're not a random act of cosmic chance. We are the result of the very willful and specific creative act of God. We come from your very hands, from your will. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand tonight.